and uh, next, our um, next presentation before our break um, will be uh, from Amelix Pharmaceuticals. Um, it's uh, Jamie Timmons, head of scientific communications, who will be giving an update um, on Centaur, um, the US EAP data analyses, um, and other uh, future plans. Great, thank you so much. Share these slides here. I'm sure someone will yell at me if you can't see the slides, um, but thank you very much for the opportunity to present today and for you know the excellent presentations I'm given so far, I'm learning a lot. Um, I'm very thrilled to represent Amelix. And as you can see by the title, talk is a bit of a hodgepodge. Um, we thought we'd just give an update um, since, since we were here uh, last year. Um, so just a few quick notes. Um, we're talking today about sodium phenylbutyrate and terursidiol. Uh, many of you also know um, this is AMX35. Um, you'll see us abbreviating throughout the presentation as PB and terso, um, all, the, all the same things. Um, for those outside the US, this is an investigational drug in EMEA, Asia Pacific and Latin America. Um, and some of the content that we're gonna go through today has not been evaluated by um, any health authority. And so our outline is to go through some recently reported post-hoc analyses from the CENTAR trial. Um, we're continuing to learn a lot uh, from that data set and uh, share those. We also do have safety results from the US Expanded Access Program that was completed last year. And then looking forward uh, to next year, a, a huge milestone for us is the Phoenix study um, and, and the readout that's planned for next year as well. And then we'll also give a quick update on some other um, activities and studies that, that we've been up to as well. Um, so starting with Centaur trial and the PROAC survival analysis. So um, these results were published about a month ago and um, we've had a lot of interest in, in this analysis. So I, I thought I'd go through in a little bit more detail. Quick reminder about the CENTAR trial design. So um, there were two phases to the trial, a placebo controlled uh, phase, which was 24 weeks, about six months long, and then a longer open label extension phase that actually went out to 152 weeks, um, about three and a half years um, from randomization. Um, so of course, during the first 24 weeks, um, groups were randomized to either active PB and terso or placebo, in the open label extension phase, everyone who continued was receiving active therapy. And so when we think about the Centaur results, um, we've got function over the first six months um, during that placebo controlled phase. And then our survival analysis is way out at the end there where the arrow ends You know, after 152 weeks after randomization. Um, one important thing about the survival analysis is that we are comparing the groups as originally randomized. So that blue group to the gray group is the, the comparison for survival. And so when we look at that, uh, that result, comparing again, the blue group to the gray group, we see a 4.8 month difference in survival um, with the, the group that received PB and terso. Um, and so this result in and of itself, of course, was of you know, high interest to us and to the community um, and indicated you know, a survival difference with, uh, with earlier treatment with PB and terso. Um, but as I mentioned, we've got a, a little bit of a conundrum um, because um, that placebo group did cross over um, and received active treatment in the open label extension phase. And so you know, the main question that comes up is, well, what would have happened if you had a true placebo comparison, a true treatment naive comparator. And I think this is something that um, we dealt with and that I know other trials will also um, be considering too with um, the importance of open label extension phases. Um, so probably logical that if you have a group that's crossing over from placebo to received active treatment, um, you may be underestimating um, the, the survival difference um, when comparing the groups as originally randomized, as shown in this little figure here. Um, so you're comparing a, a group um, that has some active treatment in it um, and not a treatment naive comparator. And in Centaur, 71% uh, of the participants in that gray group, that placebo, quote unquote placebo group, did receive um, some PB and terso. 
And so we've tackled this question in a few ways. Um, the first analysis that we did was called a rank preserving structural failure time model, our PSFTM. Um, I know a few other um, uh, trials have also used this method recently. Um, and that's a way to model what the placebo group would have looked like if they had not received active treatment. Um, it's a great method. It's used frequently in oncology. What we found is that if you're not a statistician, it's it's a little hard to understand um, and a little hard to, um, to explain. And so we were looking for other ways to evaluate the survival difference in a way that um, is perhaps a little bit easier to, um, to follow and to understand. And so then we started looking at external controls um, to have, again, a true treatment naive comparator group. So what we did was um, create an external control group using the PROACT data set. And um, when you create an external control, I'm sure as many of you know, it's so important to have a well-matched comparator group because if you don't have that, then it's really difficult to interpret the results. So I'm actually gonna spend more time talking about um, how we evaluated the match of the groups than the actual results. Um, but shown here is um, you know, the process for developing this external control group. So we started with the entire PROACT data set, which is at the top of the funnel. Um, and then we narrowed down to control participants, so placebo participants only. We didn't, of course, want to be comparing to um, other participants who received other treatments and trials. Um, we needed to have available ALS FRSR data, which I'll get into in a bit why we did that. Um, and then, of course, meet the key inclusion criteria from Centaur. So that's uh, shown on the right, the age, the ls Coriel criteria, definite diagnosis, so three or more body regions involved. Less than, or eight, uh, less than or equal to 18 months from symptom onset, and then our SVC or S FVC greater than 60%. So that narrowed our population down. And then of course, we're doing a survival analysis. So we need to have known mortality information, which again, narrowed the population down. And then taking that group of, of folks, that 134 participants, we then performed propensity score matching um, to get an even closer match. So you're really trying to get a true apples to apples comparison. And so the covariates that we matched on were time since symptom onset, pre-baseline slope, vital capacity, and age. These are of course known um, prognostic significance um, in ALS in terms of um, covariates used there. So we got down to 85 in terms of our comparison group to compare to the 89 participants who were originally in the PB and Terso group. And so um, what I found really interesting is, of course, the, the matched covariates that are at the top above that bolded line, um, those were well matched, which we would hope so since we matched them, we propensity score matched them on purpose. And so we can see nice comparison between that Centaur, PB, and Terso group and our new external control group in terms of those matched covariates. Um, but the thing that was really interesting and, and nice in terms of supporting um, this process is that our unmatched covariates also um, ended up being very nicely matched between the groups. So bulbar onset, really is all use, baseline ALS FRSR score, and time since diagnosis. So it's showing us that using PROACT, we are able to create kind of this synthetic control that matches very nicely to the active group from Centaur. Another way that we assessed the match is actually looking at ALS FRSR. So I know we're talking about survival, but um, as mentioned, we did make sure that we were looking at uh, participants from PROACT that did have an ALS FRSR, um, at least two ALS FRSR scores. And so what I'm showing here are Centaur ALS FRSR slope at the end of 24 weeks. And so we have the PB and Terso group um, progressing slower than the original placebo group. And if you look at that PROACT external control group um, that we you know, matched and did that process with, their slope of ALS FRSR change is exactly the same as the placebo group in Centaur. So again, indicating that that group is aligning nicely and behaving similarly in terms of progression 
as, a, as the treatment naive group over those first 24 weeks in SEPTAR. So with that process of determining, you know, how strong the match was and, and you know, matching further um, the groups, we then compared the survival between the groups. Um, so shown here, we have the blue line. That's the centaur group, um, PB and Terso group from the trial. So no changes um, to that group. That's their original survival. The red line is what's new here. The red line is the external control group from PROACT. And what we can see is when we compare the centaur survival in the active group to a treatment naive external control, we are seeing a survival difference of about 10 months, um, which is indicating that um, that treatment naive group um, is having a shorter survival than that placebo group in centaur that had some um, exposure to the therapy. So a longer survival difference when we are able to um, have a true placebo control, if you will. Um, and the thing that was interesting to us too is this 10 month difference actually aligned um, almost exactly to the difference we saw using that other method, the RPSFTM. And so our takeaways from here were, um, this analysis supports the original survival analysis um, using the originally randomized groups. Um, and that we have some nice methodologies, both the RPSFTM and using PROACT to, um, to evaluate the survival difference when we have crossover in the open label extension. Um, next, some additional biomarker analyses that we've performed in Centaur. Um, so we, uh, as you may know, in Centaur, we did look at neurofilament. We did not see a difference in neurofilament over the six months in Centaur. Um, and so we've continued to, um, to think about biomarkers and to evaluate biomarkers. Um, as you know, neuroinflammation is um, certainly a, a hallmark in ALS. And there has been nice research on the kidneys um, showing that there is a correlation with disease severity, progression, and survival in ALS. And there is some literature around CRP as well too, although I think a lot of us that have um, you know, worked in medicine know that CRP can, can be a little nonspecific as well. Um, and so why were we interested, especially in the, the kittenases? Um, it's actually from another study um, that we did in Alzheimer's disease, where um, in our Alzheimer's disease study, which was a short and, and small kind of exploratory um, trial, we did see that PB and Terso um, reduce concentration of YKL40, one of, one of the neuroinflammatory um, biomarkers. So when we saw that in Alzheimer's, we we're like, oh, maybe we should go back and um, look, at, look at this in Centaur because that, that was not a biomarker that we originally looked at. Um, fortunately, we had stored our plasma um, samples from Centaur and were able to kind of look back um, at the, the neuroinflammatory biomarkers post hoc. Um, using those stored samples. And so in this analysis, uh, we did see a difference in YKL40 and CRP with PB and Terso use. Um, we see a trend you know, over the first uh, 12 weeks of the study and then continued um, through week 24. Uh, we did also see a, um, a correlation between disease progression um, and, and these biomarkers as well too. We did evaluate uh, KIT1 and did not see a, a difference in those biomarkers. So the way we look at these, are they're interesting. Um, we certainly plan to evaluate these biomarkers and others um, as part of Phoenix um, to, to further elucidate um, you know, what this means and the potential mechanism here, but um, definitely a, a finding of interest as well. I'll briefly touch on safety results from the US Expanded Access Program. Um, so last year we had uh, the largest single product EAP to date in the US. I hope that, that we're being eclipsed or will be eclipsed soon in terms of um, being able to call ourselves the, the largest to date back then. Um, and this was of course to provide pre-approval access to PB and Terso. Um, the US EAP enrolled participants who were otherwise not eligible uh, for any trial, and there were 194 participants um, enrolled across 22 sites in the US. And you can see the sites um, highlighted on the map there. 
we did not uh, collect efficacy data from um, this study just due to uh, time constraints, really. Um, but we do have safety data. And so um, the safety conclusions um, from the initial look at the EAP are, are quite interesting because we're really looking at a group of people who otherwise um, you know, are not in trials and are, are not evaluated in trials. Um, and so what we see is a safety profile that is actually uh, quite similar to the safety profile that we saw in the CENTAR trial. So despite differences in these populations, we're seeing a similar um, number of um, serious adverse events of study discontinuations and uh, seeing kind of our most common adverse events fall um, in very similar ways as in centaur, um, diarrhea and nausea being the most common. Right, so I'm just watching my clock here. Um, I'll, I'll briefly go through the Phoenix trial, which as I mentioned, is a huge, um, huge milestone for us next year and one we're, we're very excited and, and planning for. Um, so Phoenix is a, a larger, longer global trial of PB and Terso and ALS. Um, the eligibility criteria are broader than Centaur, as you can see on the right hand, um, clinically definite or probable ALS, less than 24 months from symptom onset, and SVC greater than 55%, 48-week um, trial, and an open label extension. So we have got 12 countries, 69 sites, 664 participants. Um, this is a largely European trial, um, but there are 112 US participants. And in terms of endpoints, um, it's uh, we're going to be talking about Phoenix data for a while, as, as we have been talking about Centaur data for a while. So it'll be a very rich um, data source, both for Amlex and for the community as well, too. Um, the primary endpoint is the ALS FRSR. Um, we will be adjusting for mortality, so we will be accounting for deaths, given that this is a 48-week trial, longer duration than Centaur. Secondary endpoints are LSEC 40 overall survival, SVC, and ALS FRSR change from baseline to week 24. Uh, the little asterisk is there with overall survival just to highlight that next year at the end of 48 weeks, the overall survival data will not be mature. And so um, we will not be uh, statistically evaluating the treatment difference in overall survival. So just wanted to set expectations that um, those data will come at a later date when the survival analysis is mature. And we will be evaluating exploratory endpoints, um, EQ5D5L, EQVOS, ALS life events as shown, um, the staging systems, caregiver burden, and of course, as mentioned already, plasma biomarkers. And in terms of next steps, um, so earlier this year, we announced that enrollment was complete. Um, right now, as of today, eligible participants that are completing the double, dry, uh, double blind treatment period are being enrolled into the open label extension um, in Europe. And uh, we are anticipating top line data in Q2 of next year. And so just looking at the clock, I'm gonna um, advance uh, a little bit to the end here, just to um, highlight, I think something that's really exciting and that we maybe don't necessarily think about every day because we're um, you know, very hyper-focused on ALS, but um, given the findings that we've had from Centaur and also from our Alzheimer's disease study, um, we have started to utilize those learnings um, to evaluate other neurodegenerative diseases. And um, while we remain very committed um, to ALS and continue to grow our pipeline in ALS, um, there are other diseases with a very high unmet need, including uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, which we have a study that um, is planned to start really any day now before the end of the year, as well as Wolfram syndrome, uh, which is a, a smaller um, proof of concept study. Um, and I think those learnings also will likely be able to apply back to ALS. So um, exciting to be able to um, continue to advance care for those with ALS, but also um, address the unmet needs and other neurodegenerative diseases as well. Um, and I'll conclude uh, there. Happy to take any questions now uh, or during the, the panel session later. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thanks for the great update. And it's really encouraging to see that we're learning more 
about your drug all the time. Um, I'll I'll just ask a, a I think we have time for at least one. Um, so one question is, given the broader population, how do you expect uh, data to change versus the Centaur trial? So the the Phoenix trial, broader population. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a, a great question when we when we think about it a lot. I think there's a variety of factors here. We're we're not only looking at a broader population, but also a longer period of time. So a difference of 24 weeks uh, to 48 weeks. I think the other key consideration is Phoenix is a much larger trial. So the power um, of Phoenix from a statistical standpoint is um, is much greater than than we saw in Centaur. So it's really hard to comment on exactly you know the comparison b between Centaur and Phoenix, but Phoenix has been designed and powered. Um, you know, to 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 give us the the answer in terms of um, the the endpoints that we're seeking for sure, and I think it'll it'll just continue to build on the data that that we already have from Centaur. Thank you. And then um, a quick question on your YKL forty um, results. So it it was presented as um, uh, untreated versus PB and Terso. Was the PB and Terso cohort actually? Um, uh, combining the folks who were in the complete treatment cohort and then those on the open label extension as well, or was it just the treatment cohort? Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Um, those biomarker results are only over the first 24 weeks. So that is a true kind of treatment to placebo comparator. Fantastic. Well, I, I hope we can uh, address the other questions um, later in the afternoon. Um, Happy to. Right now, I think we'll go to break uh, briefly um, and we'll reconvene.